Gentlemen, welcome to Open Aperio 2017. Uh, I'm Ian Dolphin, Executive Director of the Aperio Foundation. I'm going to open the proceedings by saying a few words about the, the last year, and then I'm going to introduce our, uh, our keynote speaker. So welcome, and thank you to our platinum sponsor, Longsight. Your support is very much appreciated. And to Unicon, and to Hank from NCAST, who's doing the streaming of the the main sessions over at the back of the room. I have one housekeeping announcement. Uh, Linda Fang from Unicon has been weathered in somewhere overnight, so she can't make this afternoon's session. We've switched the State of the Learning Analytics Initiative from 3.45 this afternoon to 1.30 tomorrow afternoon in Flower, and we've moved the lightning talks into this room so that they can be streamed. So if you're doing a lightning talk, please be here at 3.45. This event is part of uh, a global network of Aperio events. We have events in Europe, in South Africa, in China, and in Japan. We've had around 750 attendees at our face-to-face uh, -face events this year. We've had 400 attendees at a Sakai virtual conference. and a couple of hundred at a series of webinars that we, uh, that we run. How many of you have attended Open Aperio before? Thank you. How many of you attended a JSIG or a Sakai conference before? And how many of you is this the first time? Great, thanks a lot. So Aperio's mission, which we like to remind ourselves of, of on, on these occasions, is really focused around developing and sustaining open source software to support the educational mission, to support learning, teaching, and research. For those of you who don't know Aperio, we're a membership organization with members on each continent except Antarctica. Legally, we're a nonprofit registered in the US state of New Jersey. We have uh, an elected board of directors, uh, and we have a strong and lasting partnership with a consortium of around 72 French institutions. Uh, that consortium is called ASAP Portail. What does Aperio exist to do? Well, let's just pause for a moment. We've all probably been involved in interinstitutional and other collaborations. What does the maths look like? Well, very frequently, and I, I borrowed this slide from my friend and colleague John Norman at the University of Cambridge, you end up with this equation that has 2 plus 2 plus 2 equaling 5. To every collaboration, there is an overhead. The point is, Aperio exists to reduce that overhead and to make collaboration between institutions and individuals easier. So we do that by managing intellectual property collectively. Instead of multiple agreements with multiple institutions. When you contribute to one of our projects, you assign the rights to us to use that in perpetuity, one central fixed point to manage IPR. And that gets, cuts through some of the inter-institutional wrangling that is wrapped around any project. And we provide um, a set of shared services that are designed to reduce friction. I am not going to work my way through this list we keep them deliberately light and we believe deliberately necessary. I will pick out one or two of these to talk a little bit more about. In practice, we have educational institutions and commercial partners who pay membership dues to the foundation, which pays for those core services, those shared services, and we have uh, sustaining subscriptions for our software projects. But of course, alongside those financial uh, contributions are contributions from a huge number of volunteers in our community. And we would not be what we are without our volunteers. So a big thanks to you for making this what it can be. Our software communities, we don't like to call them projects because a project su suggests a, a fixed start and end point, and some of our projects like uPortal and CAS and Sakai have been around for a long time. Others are rather newer. We have 19 currently uh, sponsored projects, including those in incubation. I don't have time to talk through each of these clearly. You can find more details in the annual report on the website, which we're 
also tweeting today. But let's walk through one or two highlights, particularly of the last year. New into incubation this year, we have three projects. SUGI, uh, Standards-Based Tool and Environment Connection, you can hear more about that this week. Elms Learning Network, suite of distributed tools to support learning. Was that Brian? <laughs> hey. And AngularJS Portal, which re re represents an alternative responsive front end to, to uPortal. So three new projects into incubation. We have a cluster of projects around uh, learning analytics, open dashboard, learning analytics processor, open learning record warehouse. I'm going to say a little bit more about these later on. But we're seeing significant new adoptions here in the US and Europe. The JISC service in the UK, a national service that uses some of our learning analytics components, is going live. And the French, French Ministry of Education are supporting a pilot which could lead to wider adoption in France. I've mentioned incubation, so we're seeing steady and increasing interest in our incubation process. It's a stepped process. It's written down. You can see it on the website. But perhaps more critically, our incubation process is supported by volunteer mentors from our community. People who have a range of different general or specialist experiences, which act as uh, a trusted friend for the project, which provide an external view. Think of some stuff that the project couldn't do. Now, we operate this very much on the basis of teaching a person to fish. You know the story? Mentors don't do things for projects. Mentors help projects do things for themselves. Now, if you want to know more about that, because I think it's a great personal development opportunity, please see me or another board member uh, during the course of the, the week. We need additional volunteers to sustain this activity and to expand it, and it would be great if you could participate. Working through some of our other projects with the very edited highlights. We've seen some significant changes in the Open Academic Environment Project in the last year. We've seen a renewed vision. We've seen an opening out to um, build and welcome contributions from outside the project. And most recently, and this is something I'm going to say a little bit more about later on, we've seen OAE begin to work with SUGI to add IMS Global LTI tools uh, capability to the environment. That opens up some really interesting potential. And I hope you take the time while you're here to explore the open academic environment, which we're using to support the conference for the first time. Beadwork is a calendaring solution, picked up significant new uh, adoption this year. Interestingly enough, uh, in the library world, Four-point releases over the last year and significant improvements in public calendaring. CAS, widely used single sign-on solution, widely used in higher education. And if you wander around the world as I do, you look at hotel chains using it. A little while ago, World of Warcraft were using it for single sign-on for their website. So this is a scalable solution. Improved automation and significantly improved participation in the project uh, via GitHub. Karuta, next generation e-portfolio solution, two point releases over the course of the last year with significant improvements to portfolio creation and administration. But more critically, Karuta has seen some very significant adoption in France and in Belgium and in North America, and particularly uh, in Europe there. Opencast is really the the soup to nuts of lecture capture, media management, and distribution, and I'm sure I've just missed something out. Um, Opencast has had a couple of point releases. It's run a quality booster initiative that's been it's effectively supported by fundraising in the community, and has seen some significant growth, particularly in uh, Western Europe and Germany. Sakai, which I know many of you are, here are involved with, of course, we saw the release of Sakai 11 last June with responsive design, a gradebook redesign, MathJax support throughout. Three maintenance releases over the course of the year. Neil, did that latest release actually get out, or is it imminent? I thought I saw a note that it was out. So four releases over the course of the year. I'm pleased to see my slides made outdated by the, the growth of the, uh, the community and its activity. 
Accessibility work on Sakai is underway. That's kind of a perpetual activity and has to be. I mentioned the Sakai Virtual Conference. Uh, thanks to Wilma from Longsight for organizing that, as always. Very significant levels of participation, 400 people. That's great. Sakai has regional meetings. It has regular open calls. There are lots of ways to participate. And we continue to discover new adoptions. Over the course of the last few months, we discovered that we had 40 or 50 adoptions of Sakai in China. We don't know more, much more about them, but we're working on that. <laughs> Unit time, uh, scheduling, or where I come from, timetabling solution. Uh, Unit time 4.2 is in beta. They've done some integration work with Banner and Degree Works. Mobile and responsive design and development, 55 adoptions in 40 countries. And if you go to our YouTube channel, which I would recommend generally, and look at some of the, uh, the plays on the Unitime webinars that we've run, they're in thousands of views. This is interesting stuff. If you're not directly involved in uh, course scheduling and calendaring and timetabling, pass the message on back home. Ask folks to take a look at Unitime. Uportal, one of our very long-standing projects. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, AngularJS portal in incubation, moving to an Aperio repo. Uh, Uportal really at this point represents a mature ecosystem of portlets and services. Significant increase in the number of contributors, more than doubled in the last year. And Uportal also now has one of those supporting subscriptions that I mentioned. You can find more details about that on the website or see me or Jim Helwig from the U-Portal Steering Group over the next, uh, next few days. Xerti uh, is now had th three releases in the last year. They organized a very successful developer event with around 20 developers uh, in Edinburgh earlier in the year. The Belgian government are making Xerti available to all teachers uh, in Belgium. If you are interested in authoring interactive and highly accessible content, then you should really take a look at Xerti. It plays in a wide variety of environments or outside an environment, the content it produces, that is. You can find more about all these projects and other activities in the Aperio annual report, but I did want to call out uh, a few things from outside project land. First of all, John Lewis. John Lewis is, has stood down this year as chair of the uh, Aperio Licensing Group. John was chair of the JSIG Licensing Group, and he was chair of the Sakai Licensing Group, and I think we rounded it to around 10 years of activity. So John, clearly time for a break. John, by the way, is not a lawyer. Uh, he, he will always begin what he says by saying he's not a lawyer. But give John a big hand for that <laughs> commitment. And we've been fortunate enough to secure a volunteer who knows a huge amount about licensing to, to chair the group. A big hand for Andrew Petro from Wisconsin-Madison. Andrew and the group are going to be working hard to expand the licensing group over the next uh, few months. If you have an interest in open source licensing, or if you have an interest in finding out more about open source licensing, pull us aside over the course of the next few days for a conversation. We've improved communication over the course of the last year, and we're continuing to improve it. Improve it. But I wanted to call out the contribution of Lucy Appert from Columbia. Lucy, here. Yeah. Lucy edits our newsletter, she hustles people for content and does a fantastic job. Another example of a volunteer who we just can't do without. Uh, we're going to work on improvements to the newsletter over the next year and we are going to work on better integration with the website. So look out for that, it's coming soon. And now I will give you the longest segue into uh, a keynote that you might have heard. I'll try and keep it as short as I can. So these projects, these software communities, they don't represent 
and architecture, and they're not, we're not building a suite here. Think of it more as a landscape. If you render those software communities into functions, you end up with a very, very busy slide. We have a bunch of stuff there in black that represents infrastructure, and we have a bunch of stuff which represents services or tools or environments that focus on learning and teaching. As a foundation, we don't mandate that our projects work together. We've had experiences in the deep past with that that have taught us some pretty important lessons. Software communities have to evolve at their own pace. They have their own adoption rates, they grow their own contribution rates. Trying to jam them together doesn't work, so we don't do it. But we do encourage connections between our projects. I wanted to call out just one example that I mentioned earlier recently. So that photograph is Chuck, Miguel, Salah, and Matilde working to use SUGI to add LTI launch to the open academic environment. One and a half days in, it wasn't finished, but there was a great proof of concept. There was a great prototype there. And that demonstrates, I think, the power of open source communities collaborating around open standards. And I think that's a really significant moment on that faux pol Polaroid. But it's not just uh, what we do, but how we do it and how we plan things. If you look at the learning analytics landscape today, you see a lot of activity around prediction for, for intervention. You see on the near horizon, on the coming soon, and there's some great work from the University of Michigan on this, using big data tools to provide evidence, albeit sometimes partial evidence, of learning outcomes. And that's an interesting coming soon. And in the future, folks like Solar, the Society of Learning Analytics Research, talk about prediction to create learning pathways for individual learners. Now, the approach that we've taken with our analytics stack is different from the one that you'll find presented by many commercial proprietary vendors. If you've got a commercial proprietary learning management system or an SIS, they, the commercial proprietary vendors, will frequently try and sell you an analytics solution before you've even asked the question. We have separated our learning analytics work out into components. They use common standards and protocols and indeed, in that JISC national pilot that I mentioned that's being transformed into a service, JISC chose to use a different learner record store than, than ours. And it worked out just fine. I think that's a great thing because it shows that we are focused on providing choice for our institutions and choice for entities like JISC producing a national service. But let's face it. There's another reason for keeping that data separate and not bundling it with your SIS or necessarily with your LMS. When we move to a more serious adoption of that future state of the creation of individual learning pathways, the last place you want your data probably is in your SIS. So in what we do and how we do it, we're preparing for the future. We will not do this alone, however. We work with a variety of other agencies. I've called out four in particular from our learning analytics work. We work with the uh, Post-Secondary Education Standards Council around Transcript Exchange, the Ed Exchange Project. We work with DISC, which was established by ADL to assist XAPI, and we're currently working with them to share their work on XAPI profiles, which will improve adoption. Uh, Aaron Silver from DISC, uh, from DISC sorry, is not in the room now, but he'll be around this afternoon if you want to catch him and have a conversation with him. We work with the Society for Learning Analytics Research. We've helped run their hackathons for the last three years. We work with Solar increasingly with the perspective that we want to take to identify the great research ideas that are going to make a transformation in production and help move them into production through our incubation process. That's a conversation which is continuing. And lastly, JISC, 
uh, one of our members, a UK national agency supporting uh, higher education, have large-scale learning analytics deployments that, that we can learn from. But of course, underpinning all of this uh, is community. It's you. All Aperio does, all ASAP does, are driven by community needs, institutional needs, and the folks who work in those institutions. So in a very real sense, the message that I want to bring this morning is that it's about you. That was the end of the very long seg segue. The Aperio landscape, as you've seen, has a focus on tools and environments and services to support the academic mission. There's an obvious connection between that work and the converse conversation that the EDUCORS Learning Initiative began a couple of years ago. This focused on what the salient characteristics of the next generation of digital learning environment might be. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, the director of the EDUCORS Learning Initiative, Malcolm Brown, is going to speak to us about why that next generation environment should be viewed as a keystone for, for student success. So please join me in welcoming uh, Malcolm and welcome to Open Aperio. Thank you. There's going to be a, the 21st century equivalent of Clark Kent going into the phone booth to change into something else while we switch uh, devices here. Actually, let's do it this way. Can, everyone can hear me? Yeah. All right, good. Um, while I'm doing all this sort of uh, dealing with the computer and all that stuff, this is something I was going to have you do anyway. Would you please take a few moments, turn to your neighbor or maybe a group of three, and I'm interested in turning the direction of someone maybe you don't know all that well, and talk with them about on their campus and just try to identify the biggest single opportunity and challenge they're facing at their institution with respect to their learning environment today. Clear? So just take maybe three or four minutes, turn to your neighbor, what's the biggest challenge and opportunity you're seeing at your campus's uh, learning environment? We'll compare notes in a moment. Yeah, thank you.
All right. Okay, I'm curious. Uh, did anyone hear anything exciting, interesting, unexpected? What? Feel free to raise your hand. Anything interesting at all emerged from your conversation? Did you learn anything? Yeah, please. Yep. Great. Anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, working at large research institutions are challenge. Oh, I could just project, but uh, <laughs> uh, working at large research institutions, our challenge is to get faculty to invest the time in their teaching that it takes in order to use a lot of uh, educational technology tools. Well, there is an upfront investment of time. Faculty don't by and large want to make that investment. You'll always find a small group with whom you can uh, conduct really sophisticated projects, but scaling is the huge challenge for, uh, for us. That's sort of like uh, the speed of light being a constant in the universe. That's a constant too, I think. One other observation. Well, there must be something of interest. Yeah, please. I think there's um, uh, a bit of a balancing act between uh, learning analytics and privacy. Ah, yeah. Indeed, and that's something that's going to come more to the forefront as our learning analytics projects become more ambitious and more successful. All right, well, thank you for doing that. Um, it's a great honor and a privilege for me to be here with you today. And in a certain sense, I feel rather humble being up here because I think this community in many ways is at the very forefront of what we're going to be talking about for the next few minutes. So in a, in a very real way, I should be sitting where you are. and You should be up here on the stage telling me about what you're doing because you are actually kind of making it happen. So let's just plunge ahead. So what I like to do in these sessions is to not worry so much about whether I get through my slides or anything like that, but to really make this a sense-making uh, few minutes we spend together. So that means that at any moment where you have a question and would like to talk about something, you have two paws at your disposal, a left paw and a right paw. You can choose which one and stick it up in the air and let's have a conversation around it uh, because it really is in conversation interaction where the most interesting things happen. So I hope you will keep that in mind at any moment. So we did this already as an opening conversation is to really talk about you know, what the challenges are and I think we can discover that there are a lot of things we all share in common. You know, faculty having perhaps not enough time to be as innovative uh, as we might like them to be, challenges on the learning analytics front and things of this sort, and even commonalities that go across the oceans. So, um, this is what Ian quoted uh, in a tweet not long ago, and I think it really is what we're talking about, and it really does capture something that is a, a real trend that's going on right now, which is this move from one, from big hulking things, let's call it, down to lots of little things, sort of going from a macro to a micro direction. So this was, a, I think, a 50s science fiction film, and as Jeff Merriman is, hap is, is fond of saying, is that we're now talking about the incredible shrinking LMS, uh, and it really doesn't mean that the LMS itself is being impoverished as a functional apparatus, but rather it is having, it's coming to its more natural spot within the overall digital learning landscape rather than being what it was, which is the all-consuming thing. So we are going from these big monolithic blocks and going into fields, matrices, connections, webs, landscapes, as Ian was talking about, of smaller blocks. And you know, you can put, you know, and I said this community really is at the forefront of all this. And a lot of your materials and contributions are dotting the landscape of this new environment. So I, I think, really do think things are kind of beginning to disappear in the sense of going from that macro uh, to the micro. Think about things like these devices that are going to be popping up if they're not already in one of your rooms. Anyone have one of these already in their house? Do you like them? Yeah, okay, they like them. So uh, here you could drive your computer uh, without a keyboard. So, you know, or your, your, your computing environment, let's call it that way. 
without a keyboard at all. So this whole notion of going to the micro is something that's very much in the environment that's happening right now. And I think that's because with micro components, you, do, you acquire an agility that you don't have when you're working with large blocks of things. On the other hand, as we will be talking about, it does present other sorts of challenges that we need to come to terms with, but productive ones, let's hope. So, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this uh, <laughs> NIGDL. Some people, when they try to pronounce this acronym, will get into this silly acronym as well. Uh, I'm going to go through it very quickly because I don't think this community needs a lot of um, background on all this. Um, but there were ancestors for this. Now, when we first, we first came out with the, uh, the uh, reports uh, about two years ago, and since that time, people said, well, it's not very next generational because, after all, there are antecedents for this. And we didn't mean by using the term next generational that there were no antecedents for it. And there are lots of them. Um, did anyone in this room work on this, the entering framework? Ian? OK. So this was definitely an ancestor in terms of the, the idea and the inspiration for this. And this was uh, involved Australia, the Canada, and uh, JISC in the UK. Uh, notion of a, sort of a services environment, and they had a, a white paper that they published uh, in July 2004 that really kind of summarized their work at the time. How many people remember this project? Yep. So this, in some ways, this is a kind of an ancestor of Sakai in some ways, but this was the first, one of the first major initiatives here in this country to really think about uh, kind of liberating the environment and putting on something that was much more mobile and much more um, agile. And then, of course, Sakai came out of all that work and things like that, which um, we all know about. So there were, and this, and there, I'm sure there are many others that uh, I'm not mentioning here. So I don't mean to suggest that what we did was somehow uh, astonishingly new or um, had never been seen before. Most everything... Um, what is this? Is a Stephen Johnson book how he talks about the the proximate possible or something like that, where he says that you know what there's a, the, you know, things don't just pop out of nowhere. It's a sort of a chain event. Everything has an ancestry to it. So let's talk a little bit about the report that we brought, just to give us a common sort of framework and perhaps a common vocabulary. As I said, we brought out these two reports in uh, 2015. There were two. There was one on the NGD itself. But also, we asked our research group to go and look at their data from their student and faculty surveys that they've been doing for years to really uh, analyze current practice with the LMS so we could understand a little bit better what the current practice is with the LMS. Because we came to this uh, having been funded by the uh, Gates Foundation, and their task was they were interested in saying, they were interested in discovering, are there any funding opportunities around the LMS? And so they wanted us to kind of dig in and say, what's coming next? What, if they were to fund something, where should that funding go? And so we said, OK, we'll go and say, um, what's next for the LMS? And very, very early on, we were doing some interviews with some knowledgeable folks. And this is what really turned us around a bit. Um, some quotes from Randy Bass in an interview. And he said this. And then he said this. And so at least for me, that was, that was one of those aha moments that we're not really talking about the LMS anymore. We're really talking about something that's different. So in our LMS study, we came up with some percentages. And this is the curious thing about the LMS. The LMS is a very, very curious thing, I think. Uh, and I've been in this biz uh, since the dark ages. Um, so these are percentages from our LMS study about current practices. 99%, anyone, can anyone imagine what this 99% represents? Yes, thank you, very good. Go to the head of the class, uh, get an A for the day or whatever. Um, in 99%, or at least running one, if not more. Okay, um, and again, remember, we're talking in the academics. Now, how many of you are sort of academics by, by background? I'm sure everyone here pretty much is, okay. So imagine 99% of anyone at an academic institution adopting something or using something, wow. And 85%? is the number of faculty who use the LMS. And that's also very extraordinary. 85% of your faculty agreeing to use anything? <laughs> Imagine, I mean, all around a single campfire called the LMS, that's really extraordinary. And 75% saying that they think it's useful, at least of the ones that we talked to in these surveys. 
That's, again, that's extremely extraordinary, at least I think. Um, and then the number of percentage of students using it. So that's all kind of to the good side. Now to the funky side of things, this is, was very, very striking. Because if you said that this was going to happen on the enterprise side, say with the student information system or the financial system or the HR system, this would represent a stampede on the enterprise side, this high percentage. So what this attests to, that this, even in the face of those great adoption statistics, there is a lot of restlessness around the LMS. And the more that you begin to probe into this, it may not necessarily be directly with the LMS, but how the learning and how it's kind of impeding, its place right now is beginning to impede progress toward a more agile and fruitful learning environment. And this was the other percentage that was somewhat striking, was that only 41% of the faculty use it more than in a pedestrian way. That is to say, just to distribute, distribute their syllabus. So we thought that it really kind of it called for moving out of the box a little bit and rethinking this. And rephrasing the question is not so much what's the next thing for the LMS, but what's the LMS in the post-LMS world to kind of be a bit zen about it. Because no matter how many revs you give to the LMS, the LMS is still going to be the LMS when you're done. And again, you know, it's, you hear a lot about people liking to bash the LMS and say the LMS is this horrible thing and it's, you know, this big millstone around our neck and stuff like that. I want to make it clear that, at least from my point of view, totally agnostic with respect to the LMS. Totally agnostic. It's neither good nor bad, taken all by itself. So anyway, um, the question is, I think the problem has been is that the LMS up to this point has been pretty much equivalent with the extent of one's learning environment or campus learning environment. So the question is, can you enlarge that learning environment, retaining the LMS as part of it, if you choose to, in a way that is productive and allows your instructors and your learners to thrive and flourish? So it's more like the positioning of the LMS, I think, rather than the LMS itself. So the question is not so much what should something be, what should this new thing be, but rather what should it enable us to do? Again, going back to Randy Brass's um, quote earlier. Things like, think of these high impact experiences that Nissi talks about all the time. These are things that happen outside of the course model, and the LMS has been attached to the course model pretty tightly for as long as it's been around. But what about all these things that are also are, in fact, high impact experiences for the undergraduate uh, career? And how can that go into the digital learning environment when your LMS perhaps is focused maybe a little bit too severely around the course model? So one of the other things we did when we were doing our research was at the 2014 Educaus conference, we gathered about 50 thought leaders into a room, sat them at tables and said, imagine a new learning environment and what should this thing do for you? And we had them take the perspectives of faculty, students, and administrators. We had them put their top seven at each table on flip charts, as you see here in this picture. And then we had everyone stand up and with those uh, dots, vote for three or four of your favorite ones. Uh, and this is what is rather interested, interesting. So here are the top nine of the 60 or so that we had. Here are the top nine vote getters. Now look at what's number one. And if you also look at this thing, this chart, and begin to look at some of the, the key words you see in, in these, you're talking about integration, you're talking about connection, you're talking about interoperability, you're talking about interaction. That's what's coming to the forefront. That's what the community is saying is really essential, are those qualities. So you begin to think about interoperability very quickly. You begin to think about connectivity, think about agility, about integration of things things that can embrace a diversity of functionalities rather than trying to uh, kind of monodimensionalize them, if you will, within the confines of a single LMS. We came and said, these are the things that um, the, the environment needs to focus on. These are the types of, of domains, these types of functions that this environment really needs to focus on enabling. So it's not a question about the LMS anymore. It's really about how can we, how can we operationalize, how, we, how can we realize functionality within these domains to really support, again, our learners and instructors. And it's clear from our conversations the two key ones are these two. Personalization and customization came out, comes out all the time, and the only way to get to that is through interoperability. 
So you quickly arrive when you've followed this line of thought. Again, no surprise at all to this community, I'm sure, to the idea that what we need is not a monolithic something, but rather a component-based architecture that's all hooked together um, by standards. And so your learning environment looks a bit more like this chair. Instead of being uniform and all of one piece and all of one color and kind of nicely uniform, it can look a little bit hodgepodge. It can look a little bit patchworky that you're stitching things together uh, sometimes on a very quick basis in order to achieve a certain sort of functionality that you think is essential for your learners and for your instructors. But that's an okay thing. We have to get over wanting to think about everything's going to be monolithic and uniform uh, and instead embrace something that maybe looks a little more patchy but still serves our learners and our uh, instructors in a way that they are looking for. And so Coming back again to the question of LMS, where again, it, we're very agnostic about where the LMS, it could be something, the model that you choose at your campus could be something more traditional, where the LMS is extended by some, a few add-on applications. But also, we're talking now about interoperability, that is communication interoperability between those components, between the, those satellite components themselves, obviously. And we're talking about, obviously, sort of full duplex conversations, both in terms of data and services, around this whole network of uh, events and applications. So it really becomes something that is an active network or landscape. Again, you can use whatever metaphor, whether you think it's an ecosystem or an environment or a landscape, whatever uh, metaphor works for you, that's fine. But that's really what we're looking at. And again, also here, as all of you know too, to have this perhaps aggregate learning data as you are working on right now uh, for the benefit of learning analytics, again, to serve our learners and our instructors. So again, nothing new for this community, I'm sure. So again, you can have a, what I would call a classic uh, model for your own landscape where you have the LMS as still the linchpin and really much in the forefront, aided and abetted by a few add-on applications. You can have one where your applications begin to cover over the LMS and the UX that people have, the students and instructors have, is really through this layer of applications and much less so with LMS. And there are some schools that are stewing the LMS hub altogether, like Lynn University in Florida. Um, again, the NTDLE, as, as we came out with it, is entirely agnostic about, uh, there's no right answer here. There's only the one that best uh, affords and supports your learners. So we uh, obviously grab it onto this Lego metaphor where you can take various building blocks or parts um, that could be very disparate in size, shape, color, and design. As long as the uh, interconnect specifications match, you can build almost anything you want to. And you don't need to go very far on the internet in terms of images to see the amazing things that people can build with Legos. Another metaphor that we use sometimes is that of a smartphone. Uh, so the, the, the functionality, if you think about it, your func the, the value of your smartphone to you is not so much necessarily a single application, but the custom collection of applications on that device. And that's what really makes it especially a, a valuable device to you, is that you can just plug things into the, into the smartphone, it operates like that, and you're off to the races. And so we needed, a, we couldn't call an LMS, so we came up with this huge sort of funky thing. We thought it was next generation, again, not because necessarily it was, and it wasn't, it wasn't the first time anyone had talked about something like a component-based architecture that's connected by open standards. But really, we thought it was next generational in the sense that this is the direction we need to move in as higher education in order to support academic transformation. If we're really going to really deliver on all this talk about something transformational, we really need to think about an environment that will really support that. And so that's really what we meant when we called this a next generation thingamajiggy. Digital. Obviously, um, it's hard to imagine almost anything that happens in teaching and learning that doesn't touch the digital space in one way or another, in sometimes more modest pedestrian ways, in sometimes more substantial ways. But almost everything is digital in one sense or another. So obviously, what we're talking about is going to be digital. And it's going to be focused on learning. We really think that that is something that we need to focus on. It needs to break away from the course model and be learner-centric. Uh, in the scope, and it needs to be an environment. It needs to have an organic, dynamic quality, a sense of interconnectedness um, that really substantiates the landscape. Because if you think about uh, biological landscape, it really is not just one organism or the other. The whole thing is the mesh of all the organisms together and their interactions that make that landscape what it is. 
So that's why we call it an environment. Again, you could call it an ecosystem, whatever you might like. And that was why this horrible acronym NGDLE was born. Uh, and I really like this, note, this uh, comment from John at Athabasca when it first came out. Um, and I like to think that uh, he was he was right about it being appalling. It is kind of this gross sort of thing, and people do try to pronounce it, and they call it Nandigdol, um, which is sort of charming. Uh, but it did catch on. And the only, the only saving grace of it as an acronym is that it, if you search for it, you don't really encounter other things that have used it. <laughs> it's pretty unique. But it's, you know, as I discovered, it's not totally unique. There is, the, there is a precedent. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there is a precedent for NGDLE, and it's this book here. Um, that when linguists refer to this book, they call it, you can pick out the letters, NGDLE, you can find it. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you Google NGDLE, you will come across this in the six or 7,000 hits that you get. So I can plead that we do have uh, prior art, so to speak, on this particular front. All right, here a poll went up, so I'm going to pause here, and I'm just curious, comments, um, discussion points, Protestations of innocence. I have a. We have a mic over here. Hi. So you talked about the importance of customization and personalization, and I like the picture you had of that chair with the patchwork of material. And maybe that's something you want to put on Etsy. Um, <laughs> So I think in the paper you say, um, with personalization and customization, you talk about that being on the level of the school department and individual instructor. Yeah. So there are some folks <clears throat> in our institution that say, yeah, but we don't want to give students this. Um, we want to give students a more uniform user experience, you know, so that in the different classes they're not using four different discussion boards, et cetera, et cetera. But is there any evidence that students have a problem with that, or what are your thoughts on it? That's a really good question. Um, the evidence points in the opposite direction. So um, when I was at Dartmouth College running Blackboard, students would come and say, could you at least tell the faculty to put the syllabus in the same folder for each course so we don't have to go hunting all over the course site and say, where did they hide the syllabus? Uh, and that sentiment is reflected in the ECAR student studies that they do year after year, they're saying, oh, geez, if only the, the, you know, that were a little more uniform, it would make you know, uh, finding things on each course website um, much more easy. So it's a really good question. And um, the one thing I guess I would say is that moving from uh, the old environment to the new, you know, when you make a move, it's like there are fresh challenges. And this is certainly one of them. Coherence of the user experience would be one. Because if it's a wide open space, where anyone can come in and just sort of set up a tool and set up shop, yes, you're going to have real con con uh, coherency problems. And I agree that's an issue, and that's something that the institution's going to need to manage and make decisions about. How easy is it for you to add something? Um, I think it's the University of Toronto. Is anyone here from Toronto? Anyway, they have a mechanism whereby, uh, I believe if I understand it correctly, like faculty will nominate a tool to be added to the learning environment, and they go through some analysis. So it isn't just like anyone can dump any sort of thing there, and you have this huge undifferentiated amount of resources and applications and stuff just mounting everywhere, creating confusion, you can't find anything sort of thing. So that is one school that said, this is the way we're going to pursue it. So each school will need to pursue this question and try to maintain this coherence in a way that suits their culture and supports what they're trying to accomplish. But it's a really good question, and it really is something that uh, needs to be looked at and uh, thought about as a consequence of moving in this direction. Any other comments? We have a comment here. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little... Thank you. I'm a little uncomfortable with the, and uh, I think we're all drawn to it, the idea of environment or ecosystem, uh, the uh, organic metaphor for what we're yep. creating, because it is a built space. And like all built spaces, it's defined by the power dynamics of who can do what in that space. And I think we need to be very aware of what kind of uh, relationships we're encoding when we create a, a, a learning environment uh, that's human built, not, uh, not organic, really. Oh, I agree. Um, 
Uh, one of my other interests is classroom design and learning space design. And there, when you can't, design will always embody some sort of philosophy. And the design, what design does is that it strives to afford certain things and inhibits other things. That's what design does by, by definition. So you're right that um, now that, and I'm going to get into this later, a little bit later, but um, just to give one point away is that we now, in a more general and widespread way, are architects of our situation. So therefore, we're taking on more design uh, work with respect to our learning environment, but also have more responsibility in that regard. So I agree entirely, if I understand your point, that uh, that's a factor. Anything else? Okay, so let's uh, carry on here. So just looking around the environment, since we kind of unleashed this thing on a hapless uh, higher education community, um, we've seen it picked up in a number of ways. Uh, SURF came up with there in the Netherlands, they came up with a report uh, that is very consonant with our report in terms of direction. You can pick up that one on the left is a report written by folks from the University of Catalonia about um, directions they're moving in that are very much like the NGDLE thing. And, you know, the thing that's interesting, too, is that um, you're seeing NGDLE pop up in the most odd, odd circumstances. So here's something I came across. It's just this random... I hadn't heard about this group at all. But if you start reading this, they are talking about NGDLE as if, as if NGDLE were a common word, like a uh, laptop computer or smartphone or something. And they're talking about NGDLE creeping into uh, the, the uh, business learning environments um, so that you can provide more efficiency. So it's interesting that um, it's being picked up in a way that, and being kind of, you know, like it or not, this silly acronym is really kind of moving into the mainstream of conversation. And JISC, too, I mean, you have this adoption of this concept of a next generation digital learning environment. And, uh, you know, as a matter of fact, in all my travels since we released this report, I haven't yet, and maybe here someone would, but um, I haven't yet found anyone who said that, you know, the general idea is bad. Everyone seems to be applauding the general idea. So the question is how best to get there, not whether it's the right direction to move in. Um, and this is something that was done by the folks at Illiterate. They uh, did a Google trend search on the acronym. And as you can see, there was a spike when it was released. And then it's been pretty much in conversation since then. So um, I think uh, that means that we're all beginning to converge a little bit, have a little bit of consensus about where we need to go with our campus learning environments. And it's in this general direction of a component-based architecture that is enabled by open standards. Here we have someone from McGraw-Hill, a vendor, saying that um, distinguishing between making things free and making things open. And you can agree or disagree with the first part, but about the openness, I think, um, is really important. So it has also resonance on the, on the vendor side, the commercial side. Here's another pundit uh, talking about using different language and vocabulary for what we're talking about. It's pretty much the same idea, that we're seeing a uh, notion of layers or stacking things on top of or adjacent to or buttressing the LMS um, to enable the learning environments that we need. So it really comes down to, I think, um, interoperability and what we're going to do to enable the interoperability. I don't need to uh, talk to this community too long about this. I'm sure you're all aware of it. I'm sure many of you know a lot more about this than I do. But I think this, the notion of the success that LTI has shown in this adoption really is a wonderful sort of establishment or precedent uh, for us all. I mean, it seems to have really taken off. It seems to have really borne fruit. And it seems to have really helped us move forward uh, in a lot of ways with moving towards a more active and dynamic uh, uh, learning environment. So I think if we can continue to build on our open standards and uh, follow in the wake of what LTI has done and to move forward in other dimensions as well, we'll be well on our way to enabling what we need to have on our campuses. Now I know that a lot of your work here is done on the XAPI uh, learning data standard, but there's also Caliper and I'm I'm thinking that there, there probably will be in the future some meeting in the middle so that it won't be necessarily an either or sort of thing. But no matter which brand you choose, um, Caliper or XAPI, I think um, learning data and learning analytics is going to be the, the first really big visible impact of this new way of thinking. 
that it's going to be uh, more and more commonplace for schools, perhaps consortia of schools, to aggregate learning data, to be able on that basis to perform much more powerful and multidimensional learning analytics again some support not only the classic learning analytics, which is course success, but also other things such as technology, uh, student advising, and other forms of analytics to support our learners and our instructors. So I'm, I'm, I'm betting that this is going to be the f next big thing that's going to happen in terms of this and its most visible um, presence uh, on our campuses. Already we're seeing this is, a tr this is a diagram from UC Berkeley about them starting to set up their own system whereby they're going to be aggregating learning data from a variety of um, uh, sources and applications all aggregated into a common uh, learning record store. And this is a chart that talks a little bit about some of the uh, uh, kind of uh, details on their particular implementation. This, this is all you know, preliminary, but I think it shows this, and they're doing it at Michigan and other schools. So I think we're already seeing schools actively working very, very quickly to move in this direction about learning data. And you know, the thing that's also kind of interesting is that this is also um, kind of migrating its way into the enterprise. This is a story. Did anyone see this story on campus technology? Um, so here you have a case whereby the folks at BYU, anyone here from BYU? Maybe they can, if they are, they can talk about what this is better than I can. So as I understand it, what they're doing is that they said, OK, hmm, in order to be able to swap enterprise applications in and out much more readily, why don't we develop a layer of APIs um, so that we can swap things out and underneath beneath those APIs. So common, they're talking about the API as a kind of a common interface language or even a programming language for a variety of applications. So it's the same kind of idea that we're talking about getting to a, a standards-based way of connecting these things together that make us much more agile at bringing new things in. They were talking about here in this case how they can, by using this mechanism and this API language that they're talking about for their institution, uh, bring in a new application and begin to test it, one, and they can, by modifying the APIs, they can begin to assign 10% of the load, 20% of the load, and build it up gradually over time till they're ready to pop it into place. So it isn't so much of this big sort of things come to a grinding halt when you're actually changing horses in midstream. Uh, and they're also talking about, it's interesting, they're talking about this guy who was the enterprise architect there, saying, well, you know, it's kind of interesting that now we can start maybe thinking about uh, how the impact this might have on the learning side of things. So they've moved ahead with the domain of one's own. And they're also, he said, yeah, and maybe we could even visualize something that's called a, like a learning record store, maybe kind of build that up or something like that. So it's interesting how this idea seems to be gaining traction a little bit outside of uh, just the learning environment itself. One thing I wanted to mention is that um, Educos puts out this publication called Educos Review. It comes out six times a year. The next issue, which is the July-August issue, is going to be themed around the next generation digital learning environments. And I'm very excited about this issue because we have a lot of terrific contributions from a variety of authors. This is only some of them. And as you can see, we're really beginning to talk about um, how this is really going to move forward and what are the key issues, such as privacy, as we talked about a little bit. Um, in even intersections with the K-12 space, because you can see um, in the K-12 space as well, interest in this basic kind of approach. Um, and of course, the work that's being done at uh, Notre Dame is going to be part of that too. Um, there's going to be both a print and an online. And I would, um, I've talked to the board last night at dinner and invited the board to contribute an article to this, uh, the online version, um, so that uh, Aperio can put his voice in here and uh, uh, contribute to the conversation. So I would just suggest keep an eye out that the, the, print, the print edition will be out in July. The online edition starts, starts rolling out in July, and then we'll conclude by the end of August. We'll keep adding articles to it. Also, um, we also run a blog called Transforming Higher Ed. And if anyone, and this is like 99% uh, community driven, the posts are uh, by and large by community members. And if anyone would, was, is feeling creative or in the mood to kind of express a viewpoint in all this, uh, contact me. Uh, I'm one of the editors for the blog, and we love to have folks from the community contributing to this blog. So if you have an idea you want to try out and put it into a public space a little bit, 
um, I would say consider our blog and just get in touch with me. We can talk about it. I have an editor who will do a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of getting it online and everything. So um, let's keep, I would say, as a community, let's keep this conversation going and share the insights that you must be encountering almost on a daily basis as you move forward uh, with your work. Um, so let's return perhaps to the opening or the metaphor for this presentation, which is a key, uh, keystone. You know, a keystone is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, it's different from a cornerstone for a building because a keystone is the last thing that you put in place when you're building an arch like this. The arch is not functional until you put that into place. But once you put that keystone in place, that's when the load gets distributed across the arch and the arch is functional for what it needs to be. So I like to think of our digital learning environment as that keystone uh, for student success. Because, and I think it probably doesn't require a lot of argument to think about this, is that you know, if our learners are successful, then we are all successful. That means also our instructors are successful. Uh, and the mission that we are supporting at our institutions that's so important is also successful as well. So that's why I think uh, the digital learning environment, no matter what flavor you think you need for your campus, whatever, is really the keystone for the teaching and learning mission and its success on campus. So learning success, and the thing that makes it rather interesting is that learning success has all these other dimensions to it, not just you know, them succeeding in courses, which of course is important, but all these other things as well, um, all contribute to the learning success and the learning environment that we're thinking about and all working towards is indeed um, contributing or can contribute to all these factors as well. So um, before I go on to kind of trying to wrap things up real quick, again, is there any comment, any questions? Again, protestations of innocence that anyone wants to bring forward? Okay, um, so let's see where this is. Yeah, try this at home. This is kind of... <laughs> Actually, you know, when I came across this, it's great. You know, one of the, if you really want to get uh, some amusement, if you're feeling kind of glum and you want to just a little pickup on your day, um, just type bad design into some search engine, and it really is interesting what people have come up with. Now, I've seen people analyze this, and they say, oh, really? That guy on the bike in the air is, gonna, is actually closer to us than the kid lying on the ground, so he wouldn't impact him. But um, I'm not going to suggest that you try this at home, but things I think that are much more manageable and perhaps a little safer than what we're seeing here. I know, it kinda just, you just don't even want to look at this, because you can imagine what happened when that bike hit the ground. Holy cow. So as I mentioned before, I think the nice thing about this, but also the challenge, is that, you know, that we kind of take our destiny into our hands when we take this approach. Um, and so we become the architects of our own learning environment, which again is very enabling, but also is uh, pretty challenging. And we're going to have a whole set of new challenges to deal with. But you know, it's sort of like they'll be ours instead of having something that a compromise sort of application or something that we have to or something trying to wrestle the con the functionality we're looking for out of something that is proprietary. I think that's the very uh, freeing thing here, but it also will be the thing that has a lot of challenges for us. And why I think the work of this organization is so important, because I, as I said before, in many ways I think you're leading the way for us. And I think this is what we're going to, this is, this is the story. This is the story. It's customization and personalization. We saw from the exercise we did at one of those Educause conferences that you know, the integration of discipline-specific applications was the number one thing that people voted for. And that just attests to this notion of personalization and customization because, I mean, as the question before indicated, it's not just, this happens, you know, personalization and customization is important on so many levels at the individual learner, individual instructor, at the department, at the course, at the academic division, at the institution, across consortia. There are all these dimensions to it. It's not just at the individual basis that this stuff, stuff is important. So that's why this is significant, I think and why it's really much on the forefront when you're in conversations that this is the thing that sticks out more than any other. We're going to see more decentralization forces at work, similar to bring your own device. Um, and that could cause problems. It could cause some chaos, it could cause confusion. It could, it could call for or engender a very muddled and confusing user interface 
or interface to your uh, learning environment for your learners and instructors. That's something we're going to have to be mindful of. And as architects, we're going to have to architect that UX along with everything else that, uh, can, that is the uh, basis for the learning environment. Um, it will call for, I think, building new relationships across institutions. Um, so instead of being lone rangers and doing everything on our own, I think we're going to need to find new ways to work together as institutions in order to build the things that we need to have built. So, I mean, we're seeing already new, new styles of consortia that are con working along this, along this path to achieve and build the things that we need to, and also share the experiences that we learn from each other as we move forward and don't have to repeat the mistakes that other people have already made, perhaps. It also, I think, is going to require new relationships with vendors. There has been some conversation around the NGD level about procurement practices and the importance of procurement practices, that is, insisting on adherence to open standards when you go on the market for this or that gizmo or that application. I think we're going to need to be talking about that as well. That's hugely important in terms of moving forward, is to get the products that are being presented to us to make sure that they play nice with the open standards that are important to us so that we really can move towards that component-based architecture. Uh, policies and governance. Yes? Yes. Yeah, so the point here is that, that this is a challenge because you can get pseudo responses, I guess, maybe, that the vendor, oh, yeah, sure, we support LTI better than anyone else. And when, in fact, when you look closely, um, maybe they do kind of a crummy or a half-baked job of it. Yeah, that's, but that's why, again, this is not going to go overnight. But if we, and that's why I think also the consortia are so important because if we can begin across institutions be delivering a common message to these vendors, they're eventually going to get it. And you could insist and say on the, on the case of LTI that you have to be certified with your LTI compliance or something like that. So we, yes, it's not going to happen overnight, and it's not going to be simply because we say to the, the vendors, oh, gee, it would be nice if you guys really supported LTI too, that they're going to have to say and do it in a way that is robust enough to really suit our needs. So it is something that we're going to have to work for. It's not going to happen overnight. But we need to start working towards these new vendor relationships. Uh, policy and governance on our campus, that's also going to be very, very important. That is to say, you know, what's going to be the role for the governance bodies for our academic environment, academic IT environments in the future when we're moving in this direction? And I think it's also going to require new kinds of leadership. That is, you're going to be working consortially across campus organizations because if you think about this as a more embracing, more comprehensive digital learning environment, then all players who are involved in teaching and learning on the campus are going to be involved. So it's going to require new forms of, of leadership, I think. And finally, just kind of a last thought here. Um, often when we say, we got to design X, we start thinking about, well, it needs something that's pink, something that's red, something that's green, something that's blue. So the, the typical sort of, a lot of times, the uh, instinct is to build in terms of bounds. I know when people talk about classroom design, they start, yeah, projectors and furniture and stuff like that. Well, another way to approach it is designing things by means of verbs. What should it enable people to do? And start with that as a way of trying to approach the design of an environment or an LMS or application, whatever it might be, rather than starting with the nouns. All right. Um, a pause gone up, that means it's q and I'm going to say thank you right away for your kind attention. As I said, it was a little intimidating because I think of you folks as being really on the forefront and knowing much more about all this than I do. So I really thank you for your attention and patience. But there is, I think, a little bit of time for Q&A if anyone has any last thoughts. We have a, a question here. This might be getting too much into the weeds, but uh, maybe there's others in the audience that can comment too. But th there is a standard called LIS 2.0 or LIS, Learning uh, Information Systems, which was a way of in integrating the SISs of the world, you know, the, the enterprise SISs, with learning management systems and other learning systems. And I haven't heard much of that lately. I mean, it seems like it would have been a very key functionality because most of our systems now are like between SIS and LMS are using batch processes. Yep. 
And there was an effort at one time to have a more API-oriented messaging system between these these uh, hmm. environments. And I, I haven't heard much of, at all about this lately. Anyone heard about it? I'm afraid I, I don't know about either Chuck. There you go, Dr. Chuck. So LAS, I mean, Linda Feng is on an airplane right now, so I can say that LAS was a horrible standard because it was based on SOAP. And people in this room know that. But there is a follow-on to it that's the same data model that's beautiful in REST and experience a meteoric adoption in K-12 called one roster. So when you hear about one roster, think it's LIS done right. And so the answer is that is there, we labored with a horrible solution for nearly a decade, but then the sort of one roster is LIS 2.5, but it's gorgeous and, and, it's, and it's, it's actually being adopted even more rapidly than LTI was adopted. Okay, other comments? Ian? I thought that was a, <clears throat> excuse me. Thought that was a really useful contribution, Malcolm. Thank you. I wanted to ask a question, really, which um, is very open. Other folks on campus need to be involved in this, and I'm thinking in particular of academic libraries and the resources they hold and channel. Are there conversations going on to try and engage library community in, in this kind of work? Actually, there are. I'm working right now with uh, Professor Megan Oakleaf at Syracuse, and she just got a. Um, to uh, initiate some conversation with libraries about their participating in what we call campus learning analytics. That is, they contributing their data into the record store so that we have a more robust, more complete uh, information about what the students are doing and their engagements and things of that sort. So that's one sort of conversation we're having with libraries. Um, anyone here from the library or, or, or attached to the library? Is there much conversation about this subject, about participation in terms of learning analytics in the campus at, at your school? No. <laughs> see, that's, uh, <laughs> see, that's the thing is that, you know, it's really been kind of interesting that, you know, I think that librarians are being a little bit coy or shy or whatever term you want to use about sort of jumping into this pool. There's going to have to be a lot of encouragement here. So when you talk to a librarian at your campus, tell them, come on in, the water's fine. Uh, and I think uh, that will help. No, I'm serious, though. So you need, please engage with them, because I think they have data that will make a substantial and useful contribution to the overall aggregated learning data for the campus. Anything else? Back there. Yeah, I'm one of the... Um survivors, if you put it like that, of the e-learning framework and things like that. And um, I'd really like to be convinced it's going to be different this time, but I'm, and I'm working on it. But, um, you know, I, I mean, I've formed a whole company around the idea of an open architectures for learning and uh, worked at it for a long time. So I'd like to be you know, really convinced that it's going to happen this time, but have not quite there yet in thinking this is actually going to be, really be that different from those previous attempts in terms mm -hmm. of opening up these silos. Well, I, okay, let's take it to a show of hands. Do you think that we've reached a tipping point? How many think we, we've reached a tipping point now? A few. You know, that's a really good question. There's no way to foresee what that is. Um, but I think we're seeing some success on the open standards part of things, and as long as that continues to make progress, then I think that's the keys that we need to make the doors open and to move forward with things. So I can't say whether this, this time is going to be the charm, whether it's the third or fourth or fifth or tenth time this has been done. You know, whether it's worth founding another business on this, mm, I don't know. That's a really good question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mitch Golden. Uh, I just had a question, not so much regarding the pipes underneath, but the, uh, the difficulties of actually constructing a coherent user experience yep. out of mm -hmm. uh, open standards underneath. And I think since uh, we have Verisite here, I thought I would give them as an example. Uh, you, can, you can use LTI uh, uh, in an anti-plagiarism system, but it would require you in its conventional implementation to submit your papers in a separate place from the place where you're uh, submitting all the other things that yep. aren't going through it. And so 
Uh, the integration of to do it right requires all kinds of reworking of the uh, hooks within the um, learning environment itself. Um, do, has, do you f feel like there's a motion or anything going on in terms of the construction of a digital learning environment that not only presents a standard for the pipes that go underneath, but also has the pipes running to the right places uh, inside the building uh, so that, for example, when you uh, you know, you have the hooks into the various places that they are necessary yeah. in order to, yeah. for a user to actually want to use it. Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned coherency is going to be a real challenge as we move in this direction, and I think institutions need to keep a very, very close watch on that and to prevent things from sinking in the chaos. But let me ask you, the, the, everyone here, this question. Um, you know, we use terms like putting things in the right place and doing the right things with things. What does right mean? Is there a right, you know, whether data is aggregated by a third party provider outside the campus infrastructure or within it? What's right? Um, I would say that it's not a given that one thing is, is right or the other. That's the thing that I try to emphasize with this thinking about a next generation digital learning environment is that these notions are right or wrong. It's like, is the LMS right or not? I've said already that, I, at least to my way of thinking, that the NGDLE is agnostic on that question. We need to figure out its rightful place, whether it's there at all or not. But there's no right answer, I think. We're all trying to create, all our campus cultures are different. Their needs are different. So no learning environment is going to be the same from institution to institution, even if they're all ours, or liberal arts colleges, or community colleges, or even K-12. Um, so I think. You raise a really, really interesting question, you know, and underneath that is, you know, what is right in the sense of being correct? Is there a one-size-fits-all about this, or do we need to keep exploring and experimenting and figure out, you know, what the right or the, the best distribution of all these things is and the best configuration of things that serves our institution? So it's a really good question, um, but I would, I would um, sort of backpedal a little bit uh, and say that's something that we need to invent. So I think we're out of time now. So thank you so, so much for being here, for your kind uh, attention. And let's talk. I'm um, looking forward to, um, the Educause Learning Initiative is looking forward to doing much more work with Operio in the coming months. We'll be talking to Ian and the board about that. Um, so I'm looking forward to having much more interaction with this community than we have before. So thank you so much again.